опять пошла. Uh, good day, everyone. So, uh, the last two lectures of the course are kind of a bonus lectures. So, I would like to give uh, some sort of uh, overview of uh, certain uh, interesting topics. Mm, so, Today, I would like to talk about uh, Chibatarev density theorem and uh, its applications in uh, classical problems of number theory. Uh, but first, uh, let me remind you that we um, used the arithmetical properties of cyclotomic fields to establish the infinitude of uh, primes in a given primitive uh, <clears throat> uh, arithmetic progression or primitive residue class modulo Q. Uh, and uh, in a very stark contrast with uh, the Euclid style proof of the infinitude of primes uh, or infinitude of primes in some uh, special arithmetic progressions, such as uh, one modulo Q or uh, three modulo four or something like this, uh, the proof uh, of the general case of the Dirichlet theorem uh, uses some analytic techniques. Uh, uh, and for example, it uh, relies crucially on the notion of divergence of series. Uh, and uh, in our proof, we also use the concept of uh, uh, an order of uh, zero of a meromorphic function. Uh, and uh, today I would like to uh, start with some uh, other mm, milestone in the mm, theory of distribution of prime numbers. Uh, that is uh, the prime number theorem. Uh, so uh, after the prime number theorem uh, today, I would like to talk uh, about the uh, a, a kind of non-abelian or higher uh, version of uh, the Dirichlet theorem uh, on, on primes in arithmetic progression, which is the Chipotle density theorem. Uh, but first, uh, the prime number theorem. Uh, uh, the, the prime number theorem is an asymptotic formula for the number of uh, primes below a given uh, number x when x is large. Uh, such a number is denoted by pi of x, uh, and uh, the theorem states that if x goes to plus infinity, uh, then the number of primes below x is asymptotic to x divided by the logarithm of x, uh, uh, which means, uh, in other words, that uh, the limit uh, as x goes to plus infinity of pi of x divided by x over logarithm of x is equal to 1. So. Uh, this result was first uh, conjectured by uh, Legendre uh, in uh, 1797, uh, and uh, 40 years late, later, um, Gauss gave his own approximate formula for pi of x, which is the integral logarithm of x, uh, or integral from 2 to x dt of uh, the logarithm of uh, t. Uh, and it turns out that this approximation is uh, actually way more uh, accurate than just uh, x over logarithm of x. Uh, also, this uh, approximate formula uh, can be interpreted as the fact that uh, uh, the probability uh, or, or of a random number n greater than or equal to 2 uh, being prime is uh, rather close to 1 over uh, the logarithm of n. Uh, now, this result was a conjecture, uh, uh, and uh, the, 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 the were no results in this direction until uh, in the middle of 19th uh, century. Uh, uh, Chibyshov was able to prove uh, uh, some uh, lower and upper bounds on pi of x that are close to the correct order of uh, pi of x. Uh, so uh, th the main idea of Chibyshov was to uh, uh, consider a weighted sum of primes instead of uh, the sum with weight one. Uh, he used the function theta of x, uh, which is the sum of logarithms of primes. Uh, and uh, he also used uh, psi of x, uh, which is an even better function, uh, 
psi of x is equal to the partial sum of lambda of n. Uh, and lambda of n is uh, defined by the following uh, strange formula. Lambda of n is equal to the logarithm of p if n is the power of p uh, and uh, zero otherwise. Here, uh, p and k uh, run over primes and uh, non-negative integers. Uh, and lambda of n is called uh, the von Mann gold function. Uh, theta of x and psi of x are called uh, Chebyshev's uh, theta and psi, correspondingly. Uh, and it is actually quite easy to show that the prime number theorem uh, is actually equivalent to the following asymptotic formula. Uh, psi of x is asymptotic to theta of x and asymptotic to x. Uh, to see why this uh, uh, is true, uh, you can uh, well you can notice that uh, the function logarithm of p uh, essentially uh, behaves like a constant. Uh, so uh, it is equal to one plus little o of one multiplied by the logarithm of x uh, on uh, a very large part on, on the overwhelmingly large part of the interval from one to x. Uh, and so one uh, can expect the following uh, approximate formula. <clears throat> Theta of x is approximately pi of x multiplied by the uh, logarithm of x. Of course, this is uh, not a rigorous proof, but uh, it can be fixed uh, to be completely rigorous using uh, integration by parts and uh, <clears throat> Lebesgue-Tiltjes integration. Okay. <clears throat> uh, Next, Chebyshev was able to prove uh, the following inequalities with some uh, explicit con constants, uh, uh, little c and uh, uh, big c, uh, that are greater than zero and uh, less than infinity. Uh, so he proved that the lower limit, limit is positive and the upper limit is less than infinity. And he was uh, also able to um, prove that if uh, the limit exists, it must be equal to one. Okay, so <clears throat> uh, some uh, uh, version of uh, Chebyshev's argument uh, for the upper bound will be given uh, in the problem set uh, for the seminar. <clears throat> Okay, so the next breakthrough in the, in the understanding of uh, the distribution of prime numbers uh, uh, was achieved by uh, Riemann, uh, who wrote his uh, one and only number theoretic paper uh, when he noticed that you can use the formula for the generating function of the von Mann gold function and the Millin inversion formula uh, to prove the following uh, um, the, the following nice result about the, uh, the Chebyshev psi function. So psi of x is equal to x minus sum over some uh, set rho uh, x to the rho divided by rho. Uh, here, uh, first of all, this formula is uh, uh, true only, uh, only at the points of continuity uh, of psi of x, so x should not be a power of a prime. And second of all, uh, <clears throat> rho here uh, denotes uh, the uh, zeros of uh, zeta of s. Uh, and in the same paper, uh, uh, Riemann formulated uh, his famous Riemann hypothesis, uh, which states that uh, zeta of rho is equal to zero uh, uh, only if uh, rho uh, is either a negative uh, integer, negative uh, even integer, or a real part of rho is equal to one half. Uh, in certain sense, uh, this hypothesis is the most uh, uh, optimistic uh, uh, thing one could guess about the Riemann zeta function because uh, the zeros with uh, large uh, real parts, uh, well, 
uh, they prevent us from uh, getting a good estimate for the remainder term in the asymptotic formula. And due to uh, uh, due to the functional equation, uh, non-trivial zeros that are zeros uh, that are not equal to minus double n uh, are symmetric with respect to the map rho goes to uh, one minus rho. Uh, so if you have uh, some zero with a small real part less than one half, then you necessarily have uh, uh, a zero with uh, uh, <clears throat> with a real part greater than one half. Uh, so uh, from this, uh, <clears throat> the the prime number theorem uh, seems uh, as quite. Um, achievable result, <clears throat> but it actually required uh, 37 more years of development of complex analysis. Uh, and uh, finally, <clears throat> uh, in the end of the 19th uh, century, independently, uh, Jacques Adamar and uh, Jean, uh, Charles Jean de la Vallée Poussin uh, proved uh, the prime number theorem. Uh, the, the, the proofs of uh, Adamar and de Lavalle Poussin uh, used uh, so called uh, zero free regions uh, of uh, Riemann zeta function, uh, which are kind of a very big form of uh, the Riemann hypothesis. Uh, that is, um, uh, they state that uh, some, um, uh, some regions inside the, um, uh, the, the critical strip, uh, that is the set. Uh, real part of rho uh, greater than zero and less than one do not contain any zeros. Uh, and they were able to prove the, uh, the prime number theorem with uh, a completely explicit uh, error term. <clears throat> but uh, today I would like to uh, present uh, a bit of a different uh, argument for the prime number theorem, uh, which is a completely qualitative proof uh, so we will prove that uh, pi of x uh, is asymptotic to, uh, to, to the desired quantity, but uh, uh, we will not get any error terms at all. Uh, so, <laughs> however, this proof will capture the essence uh, of the classical argument by, uh, uh, by Adamar and de la Vallée Poussin, uh, but the main ingredient in the proof uh, the main conceptual uh, ingredient, let, let's say, is the following general result proved by Ikeara and Wiener. Uh, they proved the following result. Uh, suppose that you have uh, some non-negative, non-decreasing function on uh, non-negative real numbers, a of x, and assume that you have the following integral, f of s, integral from zero to plus infinity, a of x multiplied by e to the minus sx dx, and assume that this integral converges for all s with real part greater than one. <clears throat> assume also that uh, the following function, f of s minus c divided by uh, s minus one, uh, can be extended to a continuous function on the closed plane. So this integral converges only when uh, real part of s is greater than one, uh, but uh, if you subtract uh, a kind of singularity at uh, s equals one, uh, then you get a continuous function on a closed plane. So if you, you have a relation like this, uh, oh, this is a mistake, sorry, uh, then the limit uh, e to the minus x multiplied by a of x is actually equal to c, not one, but c. Okay, so uh, what is a good candidate for the non-negative, non-decreasing function uh, a of x in our case? Any ideas? Zeta. Uh, no, of course not. Uh, you see, uh, we, we need to get zeta on the left. So uh, what we actually want to prove is the prime number theorem. And the prime number theorem is equivalent to the fact that uh, psi of x... Uh, what? Uh, two minus one. 
power. Uh, yeah. No. Uh, so uh, the prime number theorem is equivalent to the fact that uh, psi of x is asymptotic to x. Uh, so let us take a of x to be psi of e to the x. Okay. Uh, then <clears throat> the convergence condition about the convergence when the real part of S is greater than one is absolutely trivial because uh, A of X is at most uh, X multiplied by E to the X because uh, the von Mangold function lambda of N can be bounded by the logarithm of uh, N. And so we sum over all N less than or equal uh, to X, uh, some non-negative quantities that are big O of logarithm. Uh, okay. Uh, so let us evaluate the corresponding integral. Uh, so f of s is equal to the uh, Laplace transform of uh, a of x. Uh, so <clears throat> let us split uh, the the integral into the integrals from uh, <clears throat> into the integrals between uh, consecutive logarithms of uh, natural numbers. Uh, then uh, since uh, psi of x is kind of uh, step function, uh, it it is a constant on on every such interval, and so we get a formula: f of s is equal to one over s multiplied by the sum over all n greater than or equal to one psi of oh yeah psi of n multiplied by n to the minus n uh, minus s minus n plus one to to, to the minus s. And uh, you can easily check that uh, psi of one is equal to zero. <clears throat> and so this last sum can be rearranged uh, as follows. It is the sum over all n greater than or equal to two, n to the minus s, psi of n minus psi of uh, n minus one. And this difference is uh, uh, exactly equal to uh, lambda of n. And so the resulting uh, the resulting integral is actually equal to the minus uh, logarithmic derivative of the Riemann zeta function. So what we need to check now is that if you take f of, f of s and subtract uh, its singularity at s equals one then you get a function that uh, has a continuous uh, uh, continuous extension to the <clears throat> to the line real part of s equals one uh, so the poles of this function are s equals zero uh, because it is in the denominator uh, s equals one because uh, zeta function has a pole at s equals one and s equals rho, uh, uh, where rho is zero of zeta function because you have zeta function in the denominator. Mm. Okay, so it is also easy to check that uh, zeta of rho cannot be zero if, uh, oh, sorry, not, not imaginary, but real part, real part of rho uh, cannot be greater than one. Uh, so all we need to prove uh, is uh, that zeta of one plus i t is never equal to zero. Uh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, the the difference should be extend should be possible to extend to the closet. Uh, so you to have to the half plane, right? In the statement. Yeah. Uh, so the it's... half plane, real part of S greater ah. than or equal to one. So ah, okay. we, we have a conti a continuity uh, when real part of S is greater than one automatically. And what we need to, uh, to prove is uh, like the bare minimum. We, we, we need to extend our function on, uh, on the line, which is uh, the boundary of our uh, open half plane. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. okay, so what we need to prove is that our function has no poles on the boundary except for the pole at s equals one. And these poles, of course, correspond to zeros of zeta function. So all we need to prove is that zeta of one plus it is never zero. Okay, so this is the main lemma. 
and the proof of this theorem will, will use the reasoning by uh, Adamar and Lavalier Poussin, uh, which is sorry. Uh, yeah. You said that all, all zeros are simple, or uh, all zeros of what are simple of zeta? No, uh, no, of, co of, of course, I did not say uh, uh. that, uh, though it is still uh. widely believed to be true. Uh, uh, but uh, you see, if uh, if zeta has uh, zero of any order uh, at row, then its logarithmic derivative uh, has a simple zero. Zeros of any logarithmic derivative is by definition, uh, not, not zeros, uh, poles of any logarithmic derivative uh, are by definition simple. Okay. Mm -hmm. Sorry, do we need in this lem of car that <clears throat> uh, C is not zero? Is it? Uh, uh, because uh, no, otherwise no, I, maybe... I, I, I think we, we, we do not. Uh, do you have a counterexample? Ah, no, so, but we uh, should have a pole at uh, one, yes. So uh, if, uh, if, I mean, it, uh, if it has no pole, th then yeah. the limit will be zero. Simple as that. Okay. But uh, I've, if we uh, shift uh, a bit our function, so from, from one, uh, I think the limit at infinity doesn't change what do you mean if, if we shift our function uh, i mean we can take psi of uh, uh oh okay so so cool. you see we have psi of e to the x so if you replace uh, say x by x plus one uh, mm -hmm. then uh, the function will uh, change drastically right it will uh, be essentially multiplied by e. This is because we substitute the exponent. If you try to mm, replace e to the x by e to the x plus one, that, then I don't really know what happens. Uh, you, ca you can try to uh, compute the corresponding integral. Maybe it's some, it, it is something interesting, but uh, 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 I doubt it is, okay? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Fine, so let's continue. Uh, we want to prove that uh, zeta is never zero. Uh, so how do we do this? Uh, there is a, a classical yet uh, fascinating uh, trick uh, to prove this fact. Uh, so first of all, if uh, sigma is greater than one, then we have a convergent series for uh, the logarithmic derivative of uh, Riemann zeta. <clears throat> and if you take a real part of this logarithmic derivative, then you get sum from n uh, uh, equals one to plus infinity, lambda of n multiplied by cosine of t log n. This is from the real part of uh, n to the minus i t divided by n to the, uh, to the sigma. And what we do now is uh, assume that uh, uh, that one plus it is a zero of uh, zeta function. And suppose that order of the zero is k, which is greater than or equal to one. Then uh, if you send sigma to uh, one from the right, uh, you will get the following asymptotic formula. On the other hand, and this is the main trick here, uh, we have the following uh, completely elementary inequality. Uh, three plus four times cosine of phi plus cosine of double phi is equal uh, double the square of cosine of phi plus one, which is greater than or equal to zero. Uh, well, <laughs> this statement uh, looks uh, insanely strange, strange and completely unrelated to anything that said before, but uh, still, we are going to use this uh, in the next computation. Uh, so <laughs> let us consider the following linear combination of uh, real parts of the logarithmic derivative of a zeta function. Uh, substituting this uh, into our formula for the real part, you get precisely lambda of n divided by n to the sigma uh, multiplied by this uh, uh, trigonometric polynomial. 
uh, which is non-negative. And so this linear combination is also non-negative. And so if you send uh, uh, if you send sigma to one, you are going to get a contradiction. Uh, this is because one plus double it cannot be a pole because t is not zero. Uh, and so there is a constant c such that, uh, uh, oh, I'm sorry, this should be double it. So this summoned uh, is bounded from above. And when sigma goes to one, this summoned contributes three over sigma minus one, and this summoned contributes minus four K over sigma minus one. And so you get uh, some inequality of this form. And if you send sigma to one, you are going to get the contradiction with non-negativity. So Riemann zeta function has no zeros on the edge of the critical uh, strip. And so uh, the prime number theorem is automatically true due to, uh, <clears throat> due to the, mm, the Ikeara Wiener theorem. Okay. Uh, so th this uh, is kind of the most, uh, uh, the most technic technically simple proof, uh, but also one of the most uh, conceptually difficult because you need to uh, realize that all you need to prove some asymptotic formulas uh, is to prove that certain functions have uh, no poles, then you should uh, somehow understand uh, why the uh, Ikeara Wiener theorem is true, uh, which I did not explain at all. <laughs> yeah, is, yeah, so uh, Ikeara Wiener theorem, uh, uh, its proof um, can be, I guess, reduced to some results about, uh, about Fourier transforms. Uh, now, uh, <clears throat> uh, this trick with cosines uh, is uh, the most magical part of the proof. Uh, so it uh, inspired a lot of different uh, kinds of research. Uh, in particular, uh, <clears throat> Pierre Deligne said uh, that this part of the, the, the Lavalier Poussin proof had influence on uh, his proof of veil conjectures. I, I <clears throat> personally don't know uh, where exactly uh, does uh, the same reasoning appear in the proof of veil conjectures, but if you uh, know uh, the proof uh, in details, and you, you you probably know this is this, 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 the place. Okay, <laughs> so uh, any questions about this part? This kind of magical trick, I think, it, uh, is uh, is unavoidable. But... Some, some sense yeah, yeah, yeah. O of course, of course, it is unavoidable because uh, you need to get some sort of positivity from somewhere, because uh, otherwise you are not doing anything non-trivial. Uh, so, so you you need to uh, get uh, some uh, some positive quantity from somewhere, and this is one one of the ways to do it. Mm. Well, I, I mean, not in, only in this proof, but in general. Uh, what, 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 what do you mean? Ah, uh, you mean uh, are there any proofs of prime number theorem uh, which do not use inequality with cosines? Yes. And uh, yes, the, the, there are some proofs, but uh, well, I don't exactly remember, but uh, there is a proof uh, with Banach algebras. Uh, it uses a lot, a lot of different uh, other other magical uh, things about, uh, uh, <laughs> like the whole idea of uh, constructing certain uh, pre-Banach algebras and proving they are trivial and so on and so on. Uh, and there is also an elementary proof of prime number theorem uh, by Selberg and Erdős. Uh, and uh, this elementary proof, uh, as far as I remember, do not use uh, 
it does, does not use any cosines at all, uh, but uh, due to its elementary nature, it, it is maybe even less clear than, uh, than this one. Okay, does this answer your question? Mm, yeah. yeah. Okay, so let's continue. Uh, now I would like to give kind of an uh, outline of the proof of Chubatarev's density theorem. Also, we have uh, less than 10 minutes left, so uh, soon we will need to uh, restart our conference. Uh, so suppose that you have uh, an arbitrary uh, finite Galois extension of number fields, L over K. Uh, so here uh, we would like to discuss uh, the uh, generalization of the notion of the residue class module Q. So what is the natural generalization of the residue class? Uh, one can expect uh, rather naively uh, that the appropriate generalization of the residue class uh, is the set of, of values of some polynomial. Uh, like the residue class is uh, a, a values of uh, a fine uh, linear polynomial uh, uh, q n plus a, uh, and uh, so you can expect something like this. Uh, however, uh, it turns out that proving anything about the infinitude of uh, prime numbers represented by a given polynomial is uh, a very, very diff difficult problem. And uh, uh, to this day, the only uh, family of polynomials uh, for which the infinitude of primes uh, is known are polynomials of degree one. Uh, there are no other polynomials for which we know the infinitude of, uh, of primes represented. Uh, so we need something else. And this something else comes in the form of, uh, of classes, uh, of conjugacy classes inside the Galois group. So, uh, let us uh, uh, remind ourselves the notion of the Frobenius element in Gala group. Let P be a prime ideal in uh, O sub K. Let Q be a prime ideal uh, line above P in O sub L. Uh, then the Frobenius, uh, Frobenius element uh, sigma in the Gala group of uh, L over K uh, is the unique element sigma uh, such that uh, sigma alpha is congruent to alpha to the power of norm of p modulo q for all alpha, uh, for, for all uh, integral alpha. So the Artin symbol of uh, q sends q to the corresponding uh, Frobenius element. Uh, so <clears throat> uh, what we can prove, uh, and, and we proved this result, uh, is that uh, for a given prime p, uh, <clears throat> uh, well, I, I wrote something strange here, but uh, the Artin symbol uh, of, uh, oh, ah, okay, so the Artin symbol of any prime ideal that lies above p is actually conjugate to the Artin symbol of, uh, uh, of our fixed uh, prime line above uh, P. So they are all pairwise conjugate. And so you can kind of abuse notation a little bit uh, and define uh, the Artin symbol of a prime in uh, O sub K uh, as a conjugacy class of all Artin symbols of primes lying above uh, P in uh, the corresponding Galois group. Okay, so what can we do next? Next, you can see that all unramified primes in O sub K, uh, uh, I mean, un unramified uh, in the extension are divided into uh, a set of types corresponding to the value of uh, the, this mm, abuse of notation uh, art and symbol. Uh, so it's natural to ask what is the proportion of uh, prime ideals 
of a given type. So what is the proportion of uh, prime ideals with uh, art and symbols lying in the corresponding, uh, uh, in, in a given uh, conjugacy class inside the GLA group. So the Chibotarev's uh, density theorem gives a complete answer to this question. So suppose you have a conjugacy class C inside the GLA group uh, of uh, L over K, and let's denote by pi sub C of X and L over K, the number of primes P uh, with norm below X, uh, such that uh, the corresponding Artian symbol is equal to C. Then we have the following asymptotic formula. Mm. So the number of uh, primes below X uh, that have a corresponding uh, Artian symbol is asymptotic to the number of elements in this conjugacy class divided by the number of elements in the total color group. So uh, if the conjugacy class is large, you have uh, more primes than if uh, the conjugacy class is small. Uh, and pi sub k of x is, of course, the total number of primes of prime ideals with norm below x and you can actually completely repeat the proof of uh, the prime number theorem to show that uh, uh, actually the number of primes uh, in k is always asymptotic to the number of primes uh, in q which is the same as just the number of primes below x mm, so it is asymptotic to x over logarithm of x okay so uh, on, on this uh, beautiful note, I, I would like to restart the conference. So